So uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do an introduction to NoSQL. This is geared toward someone who has not had any experience with NoSQL previously. The, uh, the expectation is that you do have some database experience already that using your conventional databases. Who here is using MySQL? Okay. So about two thirds of the people, Postgres, okay, Microsoft SQL, and Oracle. Okay, any other databases? Yes. Sybase. Okay. The. Okay. Thanks. Let's see if we can get to, okay. So the slide deck, there's quite a lot of information that I provide here. We're gonna glance over some of the information and some of the fonts are going to be really hard to see. So I would suggest downloading the slide deck if you wanna see some of the additional details. The, so if you go to the schedule site, you can view the slides. Okay, and the we talk, we ref, I reference a little bit of uh, third normal form. That who here is familiar with third normal form? Okay, so about half of you have heard of third normal form. Let me see if I can download. Okay, is there a download link on speaker? Scroll up the set slides and feedback and we have blue link down a little to your left, left, left. Oh, uh, the link, right up, there. up, 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 there you go. Right yeah, no, that's a uh, link to the uh, page, to this page, so. The, there we go, download the PDF. Uh, even my browser seems to. Uh, okay, I apologize here. I'm going to grab the, the PowerPoint off of Dropbox. Rather than struggling with that, let's see. So this won't be 
as smooth as I had hoped with uh, using the PDF. Uh, so what I'm going to go over today is a brief history of NoSQL, some of the popular NoSQL databases, a comparison between those databases, and then going over some of the terminology that you would need to use be familiar with in order to really understand NoSQL. The goal of the presentation is to make you aware of a number of the NoSQL databases so that you can select the most appropriate NoSQL database for your task as well as making you familiar with some of the NoSQL databases that could solve problems or present solutions that you weren't even aware of. The, we'll also talk about uh, consistency, replication, and performance. That's key to NoSQL databases. It's similar to the ACID requirements for traditional relational databases. And then going over some of the, we won't go into depth on how to implement NoSQL, but some of the CRUD operations the create, uh, replace, update, and delete operations that you would perform on a database, just to give you a sense of the flavor of the different databases. The, so the term itself is a common misnomer. The, it was really used, it has some relevance, but not a great deal. Uh, the SQL is a structured query language. There is structure within NoSQL, it's, but it's much more flexible. Uh, you're still performing queries, and for many of the databases, the languages are closer to programming languages that many of the NoSQL databases were designed more recently, so they're better aligned with a number of the programming languages, so that you can use the logic within a programming language for writing to your database, rather than thinking about programming and thinking about the database as two separate operations. They go hand in hand much closer. The Start for a lot of NoSQL was the start of big data. As we started being able to collect more and more data off of websites, the internet becoming ac accessible, and being able to collect user and customer information from the web that we can't really capture when people are going through the stores. There are a couple of companies like Hot Topics is trying to track users moving around in their stores and their patterns, but that type of data is much easier to do off of the internet. And the ability to store terabytes, exabytes, or petabytes of data has become much, much cheaper recently. So that has led to different data storage issues, different abilities to capture that information and be able to retrieve the information without spending a boatload of money. The history of NoSQL, in 1998, Carlos Strozzi had used the NoSQL term. That instance of NoSQL is not really applicable. The, the people who originated the current term of NoSQL were Eric Evans and Johan Oskarsson. The uh, Carlo had created a separate database, I think it's still around, but really kind of a separate concept in there. And what they were doing is they were looking at doing a, Eric was visiting from out of town at a conference in San Francisco, and he wanted to get together with a number of people and find out about alternatives to relational databases. So they needed a more or less a hashtag to describe the name of the conference, and they came up with NoSQL, and it stuck. They, they weren't particularly happy with NoSQL, but it held on. The, the history of NoSQL, uh, it really started in June of 2009. My four-year-old daughter was born in June of 2009, so NoSQL is brand new. It's a very young concept. Some of the databases have been around a little bit before 2009, that enough so that they could present at the gathering. The, so again, it's a bad name. 
but it stuck and people are using it. Some people are referring to it as not only SQL. There isn't a really consistent definition of NoSQL that works for everything. There are a lot of generalizations and through this presentation I'm going to be presenting a lot of generalizations to give you a rough idea without going into the specific implementations. There's an exception to just about everything and much of what I'm presenting is saying things like uh, there are no join operations. Well, there were no join operations and you can still work the databases with doing join operations. You may have to just take one step outside of the database or do some additional coding to do the joins. There, they tend not to be too complex, but the, the word with the generalization is why I say no joins, that was a principle that was early on, but they have made exceptions to that, and you will find joins in just about every solution. Many of the solutions were built without security in mind. They were built with performance in mind, so they didn't have things like user logins initially, but they've added that on. That means it may also not be that robust. The solutions may be being refined so that you can integrate it with your other naming authentication tools. The most general solution or description I have found for NoSQL is it is providing tools that are providing solutions for problems that were not solved by relational databases. So you have your traditional relational databases. Those are not going to be going away. Those are going to be sticking around for quite some time. The NoSQL databases will be supplementing those databases and meeting some specific purposes. It may be that the main database at your organization that's housing your most important data would be on a Relation, uh, uh, no SQL database, but your HR information, your finance information, that's going to still stay on your relational databases where they, they've been doing just fine. So it's based on the limitations of relational databases. It's not on the limitations of SQL. So it might have been better to call it no RDBMS, that not geared toward the table and relational or orientational orientation of relational databases. Looking at the most popular databases, this is uh, DB Engine's ranking, and they are ranking information based on web content, searches, technical discussions, uh, jobs such as listed on monster.com and dice.com, and looking at LinkedIn for what's included on people's resumes to be able to come up with these numbers. So you do have your relational databases are up at the top of the picture. They're, they're they're still up in the lead by quite a bit. When you're looking at the score, that Oracle's got a score of 1500. MongoDB is the first NoSQL database with a score of 195. And then some of the other relational uh, NoSQL databases start moving much further down the list. So looking at just the most popular NoSQL databases, they're listed in this order, and they're represented in a number of different types of databases. So uh, we're going, I'll go over the different types of databases to give you an idea of how they're represented. The MongoDB is a document store. Cassandra is a wide column store. That is that you can think of the database more in terms of columns than saving them in terms of rows. One of the advantages there is if you're doing a sum or an aggregate operation on a column, you're able to grab all of the information from that column and process it much quicker without having to grab unrelated row information out of there. The, there are a couple of NoSQL related projects that get thrown in with NoSQL. So uh, Solar is a search engine, but operates on many of the same principles as NoSQL. When you're learning about NoSQL, you'll see many of the same concepts in Solar, but it's very dedicated to a specific fun 
function of search engines as well as memcached is a key value store, but it's oriented specifically toward web page caching, uh, more than being a general purpose database. Redis is a key value store, one of the uh, key value store is one of the simpler databases to understand. HBase has a lot of similarities to Cassandra, and that's a column store. The uh, CouchDB and there's CouchDB and CouchBase are very similar to each other. CouchBase with some uh, relationship to MemcacheD, I believe. Uh, I haven't used it very closely myself. Uh, it's a document store with some additional characteristics of other databases that has some column capabilities as well as all of them have some key value store capabilities. And Neo4j is one of the databases I really love as a database that seems to separate itself out from all the rest of these. Neo4j is a graph database that is focused on relationships, unlike any of these others. So most of these do not have a join operation related to them, whereas the graph database is all about relationships. It's finding relationships such as, I am a friend of Joe, Joe knows how, how to uh, bake a killer omelet, and uh, uh, he knows a person in France, so I'm going to uh, go to France and find a great omelet in France, so they're going to connect me together to develop those very extensive relationships and very complex relationships within the graph database. It's also a really fun website to go to and just demo and look at the uh, graph database and the relationship. Uh, React, again, a key value store, and uh, SimpleDB is a key value store that's within the Amazon cloud. The, uh, so it's kind of proprietary that you're going to use SimpleDB when you're integrating in with Amazon Cloud. The number of databases is enormous, and many of these are still fairly young, fairly immature. You're going to be running into little odd problems when you're running into it. The folk at uh, 451 Research put this graph together, which is helpful for understanding some of the different databases. You have your traditional relational databases, uh, new SQL, uh, which is has some relational database characteristics, but kind of rethinking that. Um, many of these have not made it into the most popular list. And then NoSQL, you have your groupings of graph databases, cloud services, uh, document databases, key values, and big table, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later on. The, if you want to know more about it uh, into depth, the, a good uh, detailed overview of much of this information is in seven databases in seven weeks. It's a good easy read for most people. A couple of the chapters get into some complex areas, uh, but it's not going to be your if you're going to use MongoDB, it gives you an intro to MongoDB. It, you would still want to get one of the separate books on uh, MongoDB. Uh, but I enjoyed reading the book. It was an easy airplane flight read. NoSQL is at the bleeding edge. It's doing new things, and you're going to expect, you should be expecting that some things will be broken. They haven't gotten best practices into place. The, one of my favorite quotes was from the CSH man pages. Adventures into the esoteric periphery of seashell may reveal unexpected quirks. That describes a lot of what you do with NoSQL. The, when you're doing something that no one else has done, you're going to get unexpected quirks. It, it's fun to be cutting edge, uh, but the, with some of the databases, you may be that first person that's trying to do something. Uh, the more mature and more popular databases have a lot of the solutions in place. This one of the charts I mentioned had the, uh, the really small fonts that's better to download to read, uh, looking at the various databases. What you'll notice in 
most of the trends on these is the recent releases, there tend to be open source solutions. They tend to be running on Linux platforms rather than uh, Microsoft type of platforms. And the looking at the people who are using it, many of the famous users are at very high volume sites uh, such as Twitter, uh, Facebook, eBay, uh, where they're just inundated with huge amounts of information. And they have a variety of different formats. They have key value pairs, the wide column document and graph databases. The, uh, so I've referred to this before, the different types of databases and Solar and Memcached can fit into that area, but not very well. With key value stores, that's it tends to be a very simple concept. It's sort of a variable name and a value for that variable. So you have different keys. You have variables such as Java, C, Objective-C, C++ as the name of variables. And then you have a value for that variable. The You'll put the information into different buckets, so you'll have a code bucket and a drink bucket so that the Java variable, you can identify, okay, this is Java, but it's a coffee. This is Java, but it's talking about programming languages. And many of the key value stores are, you can't manipulate the information within the values. So you're going to store strings or you might store some simple arrays. Uh, if you're storing JSON within it, what you're going to do is you're going to retrieve that JSON value, you can modify the JSON, and then you can write it back. But what you can't do is you can't go in and say, change the 6.892 to 7.892, that the key value stores are not oriented toward changing those individual values. It tends to be just a blank value of put whatever you want in there with some types of structures. The column-oriented databases will, instead of focusing on uh, each of the rows, you'll tend to focus on columns of information and you'll have groupings within the columns. So looking at textbooks here, you might have a family uh, area where you have the author and comment information that is stored under revision. So you would look at not each column purely individually, but you're kind of looking at the columns in terms of buckets. So you're going to refer to elements within the column by the family name, revision, and then author. So revision, author, uh, text, and you run into some things like, is it text colon without a variable name? And sometimes you don't have a uh, title. So it does get a little bit confusing that they don't have hard and fast rules that you have to name everything appropriately. The uh, Neo4j is the graph databases where you have nodes of information and all of their res uh, all of their relationships to each other. So for those of you who are familiar with Games of Thrones, this is uh, Westeros and you have the various houses of Stark, Tully, Bartheon, and then within the houses you have the individual people of Stark is the house of Richard who has a child of Eddard and the various other siblings. So it's very easy to represent lots of complex relationships. There's a relationship with, of uh, Star Wars that you could certainly see it building up into something like IMDB of actors associated with films, associated with producers. The document-oriented database is uses a JSON format and with the document-oriented databases, you have the ability to go in and modify the various settings. So if you wanted to change the uh, the variable year from 1967 to 1977, you could go in and you could identify a particular element and change it. The uh, the goal with document-oriented databases gets into the discussions of joins. You, rather than doing a join operation, which is a very expensive performance-oriented operation, the 
what you do with a document is you grab all of the information that you're going to need. So for instance, for Facebook, you're not going to pull off an individual uh, wall entry, an individual comment. You're going to pull out over a complete set of like 10 or 25 comments and display those all at once. So rather than going and linking everything together, you can just go and grab a JSON element and then represent that on your web page. There's a lot of options. There are uh, some best practices for very specific implementations, but there's a lot of opportunities to use MongoDB in different ways. The uh, when you're storing it in a database, you might have an entry like a faculty member with various attributes and you have another faculty member over here. What are the differences between the two entries here? You, you may not be able to see at this uh, font size, but you can tell right off that there's more entries over here. The, the schema design does not require you to say, this is going to be all of my column headings within an area. So within uh, the MongoDB, if you want to add in additional characteristics, uh, so you've got faculty members with the various awards and contributions they've made, if you want to store their office number or their telephone number, you simply add in what's essentially a column of information for them. So you can just keep adding information after information for each individual node. You just have to keep track of uh, what you're adding so that you can query it later on. You can represent the, this is a representation of that faculty representation where one person has two awards, one person has three awards, and this person, we're tracking the location of the awards in addition. So when you're adding information, you're being asked to add columns to a relational database. Your DBAs are basically going to say, no, like put in a change of request. We're not going to listen to you, get back to us in a month. Whereas with MongoDB, you can be more creative on the fly. This is a visualizer for JSON, another way to represent uh, viewing JSON. The is it really similar to a blob concept, storage, um, I, I could not answer that uh, appropriately. It, it may be. So, uh, but... I, I am not 100% uh, on that, so I couldn't give a confident answer on, in that regard. I'm trying to watch uh, for time here. Okay, um, so uh, NoSQL uh, comparisons, this is an extension of the chart that I had showed earlier uh, with a number of the characteristics that you'll see. Uh, one of the consistency areas here is the databases are schema free for the most part. That means they, they do have a structure to them, but you don't have to define the structure before you start adding elements. The first operation for MongoDB can be essentially add a document or add a row of information. It's not create the database and then assign rows and characteristics of those rows. The, uh, many of them have replication capabilities. The, a lot of them have eventual consistency. Eventual consistency is good for things like your email, that it can be behind by a second or so, but it's really bad for things like your financial data, like your bank account. If you deposit $100 and you get your account balance, you want to see that $100 in there right away. You don't want to wait in a couple of seconds before that update comes in. And particularly, the banks don't want you to uh, go in and withdraw have $1,000 in your account, withdraw $1,000, and then withdraw $1,000 as quick as you can and then run out of the bank waiting for that update to happen. So eventual consistency works really well. Uh, Facebook pages, you're not getting your post updated. That can be a bit controversial. They don't always come in in order, and when you post, uh, someone may see your post immediately, another person may see it 30 seconds later. And people, so different areas, you may be concerned with that eventual consistency or not. Uh, very rarely you'll see foreign key representations. Neo4j has foreign keys. Uh, 
without a foreign key, that's generally meaning that you can't do a join operation without a foreign key. The, you can make up your own foreign keys, but you tend to lose a lot of the consistency that's built into relational databases for maintaining the integrity of your data. The uh, data types are frequently not required. You don't have to specify this is an integer column, this is a string column. It may be a good idea in different areas and so that your team knows what to expect in different columns, but it's not hard-coded for a number of the different databases. And uh, many of them are using newer concepts of sharding, REST APIs, uh, JSON. Many of, how many people are familiar with JSON? Okay, a little more than half of the people uh, with JSON, and then also incorporating MapReduce similar to Hadoop. The, I'm gonna skip through. Okay, this is one that I throw up for uh, my students on one of the tests. What's wrong with this? I'll tell the students to go off and for the next assignment, go off and download the latest version of NoSQL. It's April Fool's Day. What's the indication there? There is no SQL. There is not a no SQL database. It's a number of different databases. So if you're running the latest version of no SQL, it's a, a trick interview question of what's the latest version of no SQL you're running. They should be able to say which of the databases in there. Okay, uh, going over I think, hmm, okay. The, uh, so terminology and concepts, I'm going to be going over this fairly quickly for the sake of time. Uh, so I apologize for not elaborating on a number of these. Sharding is very important on a number of the databases. In your production Oracle environments where you have to spread out due to, uh, you can use partitioning to increase your performance significantly. Similar to RAID of you're spreading your operations out over multiple hard disk or multiple storage units to improve your performance. So if you've got your your data spread out across three storage units, you're approximately going to get, th theoretically, you're going to get three times the performance, maybe closer to 2.1 times the performance. But what you end up with is all of these are connected to one really big box with a lot of memory that gets really expensive, that you can be spending $100,000 on these solutions. And the NoSQL solutions are introducing sharding where you have lots of smaller systems that each have their own cheap hard disk associated with them. You can load them up on memory, put 16 gig of memory on each of the units really cheaply. And that's where you'll see a lot of the really large data farms have blade servers put together of really inexpensive machines with a lot of memory, a lot of storage, and they're really concerned with how much memory, how much storage can we add on to these boxes. So it's going from a big box mentality to a solution that you can scale out by buying lots and lots of these little units to be able to handle your needs. These units, once you get up to $100,000, you start having problems with your ordering custom machines that are built for your specific needs, which come with a significant price tag. The uh, MapReduce operations are, uh, many of the queries are basically doing a divide and conquer of split up the task, calculate the results, and then consolidate the results to get your answer. So if you, a very simple example is if you're adding a set of numbers, you might split it up and say, add all of the even numbers on this server, add all of the odd numbers on this server, this adds to 16, this adds to 20, it adds to 36. So uh, a method for splitting out tasks and then consolidating them. And the operations can get much more complex than that with uh, various operations to be able to handle what happens if one of the machines goes down or one of the machines is just slow to operate. 
So J JSON is really cool. Uh, many of you are already familiar with it. The basic syntax of it, uh, you have value pairs, uh, you have pairs that are separated by commas, you've got curly braces denoting the objects, and you've got square brackets that are denoting the arrays for your very basic setup or organization of the information. So the value pairs are just a variable name and value separated by a colon. You you can group those together, separate them by a comma, and then you can turn that into an object by putting curly brackets around it. And if you're working with the square brackets, you have an array with a variable name and various values within that, uh, is the simple way to look at JSON. The, so MongoDB, I think this is the same example from MongoDB, that it's going to store objects, it's going to retrieve objects as JSON, and it's going to write and save objects as BSON, which is binary JSON. Another concept is, this is getting into the CRUD operations, that REST operations, uh, a number of the databases are using REST keys for doing the CRUD operations. Uh, so the basic idea there is you want to be able to create, read, update, and delete, and you can pass that information through HTTP, communicating between different sources, using HTTP, doing uh, get in order to do a read operation, doing a HTTP post to do an update. You can do a put to do a create or delete does a delete. And the format for that might be uh, a URL like this would be give me the payment information out of invoices and then get into additional details of show me the invoices that start at 2006 and end at 2008 and it will oftentimes return an XML result which is similar to JSON. Uh, you can convert between XML and JSON at a, a base level. Uh, and they do have quite a number of similarities. XML kind of combines the HTTP type of format. The, and if you wanted to do an update operation with a post, you would basically pass it uh, XML information uh, the, that you can use curl to pass the XML to do an update of an entry using REST. Uh, Twitter has some uh, good examples of using REST operations, but it's limited to get and post entries at that particular API. So looking at the different databases, what, what are the programming language differences? How do you make your SQL calls? If you were looking at a traditional relational database using ANSI SQL like Oracle, you would be doing an operation of select star from relationships. That's give me all of the columns out of the relationships table. MongoDB is going to be using a dot notation, uh, similar to many of the object-oriented languages, where you're going to say, you've got a relationships database and you're going to find all of the entries out of the relationships database. The Cassandra is kind of the exception to NoSQL. Its syntax is extraordinarily close to traditional SQL. If you want a very easy transition over to some of the NoSQL solutions, 90% uh, of the basic SQL statements are going to be very similar to uh, ANSI SQL. With uh, Redis, you're doing key value stores, and you would say an operation like S members for relationship, that's grab all of the entries out of the relationships. Uh, entry with uh, doing a REST API, you would reference the local website, uh, the React database, get all of the entries out of the relationship database that are like an entry. And Neo4j, this looks complex, uh, but once you start working with it, it becomes easier to understand. What you're basically doing there is, uh, show me all of the operations that have this particular relationship. So I want to know all of the entries in that are like M or have a relationship between N and M. And I'm going to return uh, matches here. So the 
Uh, you would get matches like uh, Luke is from Tatooine, uh, Leia is from, who knows where Leia is from? <laughs> okay, Alderaan. <laughs> okay, and you would return the, uh, the different nodes, so node one, the relationship, and node two. Okay, the to do joins without foreign keys, it's, it's fairly easy in concept. All you need to do is you need to have a variable that is in common between the two entries. So one method for doing that is you can create an object ID, get a unique object ID, and you can have a ID for the original ID here and associate the employer with the people. So the employer ID of Aaron is related to this ID here, which is Broadway Tech. So having that common ID in place, can you can do queries such as Aaron works at Broadway Tech or one of the employees at Broadway Tech is Aaron. So the join operations are fairly simple, but it becomes complex to try and manage that. What happens if this entry disappears and original ID is then pointing over to a null type of operation that you have to build in. Instead of the database building in that type of logic, your programming language is responsible for building in that type of logic. The, with building out the, the NoSQL solutions, designing a NoSQL solution that can scale out and run in parallel across lots of different systems for that scalability. The challenge with doing that, with replicating the data, is maintaining right consistency that if you have data spread out across 50 systems and you have that same data that's replicated in three different places, how can you ensure that when you update it in one, in one location, it's updated in all of the rest of the locations? Do you want a solution such as eventual consistency where they eventually all update? Or do you want to have a lock operation where it says, don't provide any read operations until I've finished all of the write operations here? The, uh, many of you who have taken basic introductory database classes would be familiar with ACID concepts of atomic consistent isolated durable. The basic idea there is the uh, dual rollback of doing all or nothing. If you can't update all of the entries, then roll back to the original state and let people uh, run that operation again. So uh, the, all of these, the authors had talked together at various times and all of them agreed that these are contrived and stretched definitions that atomic consistent as isolated durable, they just wanted it to spell out acid. You, you have to do the interpretation. So Brewer in 97 came up with the term base, which is, this is the eventual consistency. It's basically available in a soft state and eventually consistent. The idea here is this is very well suited acid compliance for your financial information. The base information is, as long as I eventually get all of the information that I need, especially if it's only seconds later, I'm perfectly fine with it being eventually consistent where I don't recognize that it simply hasn't gotten an update. Like email, people will wait three seconds from the time someone sends it to retrieve the email. They'll just say, keep getting email. The cap idea Brewer introduced in uh, 2000 was consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. I find that a little bit contrived also and prefer to think of things as consistency, performance, and replication. Pick two of those. It's very difficult to get all three of those to have consistent data with performance and replication of the data. So looking at it, in terms of the three consistent performance and redundancy, you can pick two of them. Typically, you're not picking consistency and redundancy in the worlds we're working with. 
If you want consistency and performance, you can do similar to uh, RAID striping. You can split the data out into uh, four different areas, so split out into four different storage units, and don't store the same information on multiple database, multiple storage units. So uh, element A here is updated in one place. The, uh, the advantage there is your you're spreading your storage calls out across four different storage devices. And when you do a write operation, then that's going to write to just one place. The disadvantage is if you lost this unit D, you've lost that data on D. You have to go back to tape or some other mechanism for restoring that data. So you're losing redundancy there. The, if you go with uh, redundancy and performance, the, you're losing out on consistency. You replicate the information across numerous storage platforms, but at any one time, you might have elements E and E on these two units, but D and D on these two units, and that's simply giving up the consistency, a little bit of the consistency. Eventually, these two will update to E, but you're, you're keeping your redundancy and your performance. If you lose one of those storage units, you can still rebuild the data off of it. The inconsistency and redundancy, uh, typically you're not looking at uh, that very often. The, okay, so we'll get past it. The CRUD operations, okay. Thanks. The CRUD operations, uh, we'll flip through these fairly uh, quickly. The, for SQL, uh, creating, reading, and updating, for those familiar with SQL, that's just the standard syntax for it. For key value stores, uh, that's your variable and uh, value. You're going to store the information as strings and hashes, where you're going to do uh, set operations and get operations. Their uh, strings are concrete, they can't be altered. So you basically uh, create it, get it, delete the entry, you're not doing update operations off of that. The hash information allows you to change the variables. So you can have a user gym with a variable salary and you can change the 1250 operation within there. Uh, you can also store lists, sets, and sorted lists. Uh, sorted lists are good for things like having ranges to give a particular range of operations. The okay, the React uh, CRUD operations are this is using the REST operations. So you're doing uh, you're going to do a you can use the proprietary React uh, notation, or you could use HTTP calls such as calling curl to update the information or get the information. The, so for Neo4j, the, so Neo4j, I wish I had time to go and look at the, the demo here. Uh, if you're going to do, look up one thing, go to the uh, Neo4j, the learn try, take a look at it. You c it's a, a demo there that you can just play around with. It's a lot of fun and you can see a lot of potential out of it. Uh, later on. The syntax for it uh, can get complex until you get used to it. When you start looking at the, uh, the database itself, it becomes much more logical to be able to see uh, Luke has the name of Luke Skywalker. This is setting up the node information here. And Luke is friends with Han, Luke is friends with Leia, uh, Vader's devoted to the dark side, and Luke lived on to Tony. Uh, you can set up all sorts of those relationships. Uh, and looking at it in this syntax, it's easier to see node relationship node. And the uh, graphic interface for it makes it particularly easy to see that. The Google Big Table, uh, this is what started all of much of the discussion with large organizations needing to use solutions beyond just relational databases. Uh, they published a white paper in 2006, which is kind of the start uh, of all of this. It, it's 
a fairly readable document for non-techies, but it does have some complex areas and gives you insight into the early days of NoSQL. HBase and Cassandra are heavily based upon uh, Google's big, ta big tables. The, I'm going to flip through these uh, fairly quickly and start wrapping up. The, uh, the MongoDB, you're doing, again, uh, your database put right to an individual area, uh, courses, and insert a document. The MongoDB learned the uh, different terminology there that you don't have a row in MongoDB, you have a document, and then you have attributes within that document. So it's not as fixed an object as your traditional uh, rows of information. So they're calling it a document in a different way there. Uh, the, and then some of the uh, various terminology you have Documents are rows, collection, instead of tables, you have collections. Uh, databases are databases. And uh, instead of referring to columns, you refer to fields, that there are some similarities. The difference primarily being you can create fields on the fly. The uh, a simple MongoDB database is a JSON format. So this is uh, data or zip code information where you've got the city, the GPS location, population, city, and the ID is the zip code. With the idea you can have complications such as multiple cities being represented within one zip code, and you can have multiple cities uh, or multiple names for townships that Ar Arboga is actually with, is a neighborhood within Olivehurst. So as you go through, you can create different uh, information. You find out that there's exceptions to your data. You simply write it into the database. And then uh, the Cassandra uh, information is very similar here to SQL that you're doing create table, insert into, update, select statements. Very similar to SQL with the exception of there are no foreign keys, so there are no join operations. So that... Hey, uh, I'm going to throw the lights on. You've been warm. <laughs> So, Did you want to wrap up like in a minute? Yeah, uh, so that, that wraps things up. We've got another presentation starting in five minutes. So, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Sorry, sorry, I just wanted to. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's great.